Good afternoon. Um, as uh, Bill mentioned at the beginning, the report that just came out may be seen as bullish. Uh, the way or the reason why you'd look at it as bullish is because most of the numbers that came out were on the lower end or outside of the range of the pre-report estimates. Um, as we look through the various numbers, and if we could go to slide number two, uh, we, we certainly look at what the revisions uh, were from the previous periods. Uh, the reason for that is to see how good the survey is matching up with reality. And we had some really big deviations from the survey during that 2000, 2001 period. A lot of that had to do with the losses that took place because of COVID, the shutdowns that Jason uh, uh, mentioned. But it seems that the last couple of quarters, the estimates that the USDA has provided have been a lot closer to reality. Now, it's not exactly the same, you know, if you were to try to you know, estimate every single week or every single month and then match it up with the survey, the numbers wouldn't match up very well because the decisions that producers make as far as marketing, so they're determined by a lot of factors, you know, how the packers are running, what the demand picture looks like, and so forth. But overall, when you look at that June uh, inventory survey, the numbers that came out at that time were pretty close to what we saw. And so USDA didn't have a reason to go back and make any significant revisions to it. The only revision that I saw that was anything significant was the March-May pick crop uh, that was revised down by about 42,000 head. But even that one, you put it in perspective that the pick crop for the quarter was 32.9 million. It's a fairly small revision. Uh, the farrowing estimates that were, and these were intentions that were presented in the previous quarter, uh, those were brought back down by about 1%. So the producers in this survey uh, indicated that they actually, for September, November, they expect the farrow about 1.1% less than what they thought back in, uh, in June. If we could go to the next slide, slide number three, uh, for people that aren't familiar with the way that the survey and, and the, you, know, this, uh, you know, this inventory numbers work, USDA tells us, all right, how many hogs should we expect to come to market in the next three, six months? And they break it down by category. You know, what's the weight of those hogs? You know, how many hogs do we have that are 180 pounds and over? Uh, we probably have run through most of that supply because they probably came to market in September and maybe that, you know, they're going to come to market in the first week of October. And then you break it down all the way to when, you know, uh, we go into the first couple of months of, of next year. And then the USDA also asks, you know, what is the breeding herd? And that's a critical number because it determines the supply that's coming to market in the next few months, but also where we're heading in terms of you know, supplies for next year. And then what the fairway intentions are for September, November, and December, February. September, November gives us some idea as to what's going to happen next spring. December, November gives us some idea as to what's going to happen next summer. So if we could go to the next slide, I try to put the market hog inventory numbers in context. And so the way you look at it is, you know, based on this survey for September, early October, hog slaughter should be running about 1.5% less than it was a year ago. Uh, October, uh, early, mid-November, again, it's not precise. The number should be down about 1.2% from a year ago. And then December, January, February, which at least based on this survey, you'd expect the slaughter numbers to run down about 1.6% less. For the entire period, September through February, USDA is saying that we're going to have about 1 million head less than we did a year ago for marketing. Uh, and so the, and the, last, the previous year, we had fewer hogs than the, you know, the year before. And so we're seeing fewer hogs come to market, and it's a function of the smaller breeding herd, and it's a function of lower productivity. And we'll look at those factors. But uh, I, I also added some numbers just, and again, it's more for context. Uh, when you look at, and just for example, uh, for the period between the week of October 9th through mid-November, weekly slaughter during that period last year, and this is non-holiday weeks, ran about 2.6 million hogs. You take about you know the 1.2 percent reduction the USDA suggests, then we're looking about the supply that's around 2.57. 
The thing though to take away from this is that we're still in a very different place and this is seasonally the case every year. We're a different place in September, October, November than we were in June and July. Uh, we seasonally have more hogs and so we're not gonna run out of supply anytime soon. And that's good news for the consumers, especially as we look into the, into the fourth quarter. One thing that we've noticed the last couple of months is that the hair market has been extremely firm. And it's been extremely firm in part because one of our biggest customers, Mexico, is buying significant volumes. They're still preferring to buy U.S. pork. It's a uh, relatively inexpensive protein for them. The peso hasn't really gotten hurt as much. You know, some other currencies have lost a lot of value versus the U.S. dollar, but not the peso. And because of the bird flu outbreak, we're seeing very strong demand from retailers getting ready for the fourth quarter. There's going to be a significant shortfall of turkeys for that period. Uh, we lost a lot of turkeys, somewhere around one, about 5 million head or so during the spring. And we've lost another million plus head uh, in the last few weeks. And so the, the demand for hams is very strong. But I don't think we're going to, you know, I think the, the industry is still positioned to you know, supply the market pretty well through the fourth quarter. Uh, as we look forward, if you could uh, go to slide number five, to me, the breeding herd is probably one of the better numbers that we get in this report. And I have a small change. I put a, you know, I have the numbers for September 1 down 0.4%. They're actually down 0.6% year over year. Uh, we've come quite a ways from that peak on December 1, 2019. High feed costs, uncertainty about export demand. Uh, all of those have had an impact on producer decisions and their ability to expand. Uh, another thing that continues to be a big question mark for the industry is what's gonna happen with Proposition 12 and how that's gonna affect producers uh, based on the requirements that California and uh, Massachusetts are, uh, have, have put in place. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, slide number six, um, I kind of at least try to put in the map what has happened to the breeding herd over the last 12 months. You know, we've seen increases in the South uh, and uh, certainly parts of the Midwest, but then we've also seen reductions, especially as you go further out West. Uh, overall, the breeding herd right now is about 38,000 head less than it was a year ago at this time. That's important because it's gonna affect what the farrowing numbers are for the September, uh, November time period, but it's also gonna affect what those farrowings are gonna be in future quarters because the breeding herd that we have available today also determines how many hogs we're going to have available in future periods as you know as a as a carry uh one way i kind of look at what this industry has done if we can go to slide number seven is our you know whether producers have been adding more gilts or or not to the breeding herd uh at least year over year basis and we don't get any data from that the only way you can get into that number is to back into it. You know, you know what the what you started the, the quarter with, you know what the slaughter was for the quarter, how many you got, you know, how many imports came in, and you can calculate then the the the, the guilt retention as a residual of all those inputs. Uh, according to my numbers, it seems that we retain about 3.8 more gilts in the June, August time period than we did a year ago. Some of that was for replacement purposes. Uh, the industry has uh, not expanded very well. And so, you know, especially with the good profits that were made during that quarter, there was some incentive there to add a few more gilts. However, uh, we, we didn't bring in as many, you know, from, from the previous quarter. And so overall, the numbers still are lower, uh, you know, from where we were last year. Uh, one number that I wanted to mention, if we can go to the next slide, is the expectations for supplies in that March, May uh, period. We don't have a firm number for that because again, the farrowings is uh, only one input uh, into that. But we, we, what, we do, what we can do is we can look at the ratio of those farrowings to the breeding herd and to see how that's tracking with previous years. We've had now several years, 2019 was the worst, but 2020 wasn't a whole lot better where the farrowing rate has been fair, you know, lower than what we used to see in the past. 
we used to run at least during that 15, 16, 17 period, well over 50%. And uh, for the quarter, we're now at 48.3%. So that productivity number is not going in the right direction. And it's something that the producers are gonna have to work on uh, in order to improve herd health. The other part, and if we go to the next slide, the other piece of the productivity uh, uh, is you know, the, the number of pigs saved per litter. Uh, we've sort of been in a growth trend for 30, 40 years. However, it's not a linear trend. You know, we've had periods where we're growing at a faster rate, then we slow down, grow at a faster rate again. We saw we had a shock in 2014 because of the spread of the PED virus. Uh, and then now more recently, all the cases of PRS that have uh, negatively affected uh, producers. When you look at the last now eight, nine quarters, we've grown at just 0.1% on a quarter per quarter basis. That's one of the lowest numbers that we've seen in, in two decades. And so that's something that's gonna have an impact on what we are gonna see at least in that March, May uh, period, but then also further out into 2023. 20, uh, uh, and then if we can go to slide number 10, right now what, this, what the uh, survey is indicating is that we probably should expect a pick crop for uh, March, May, which corresponds to the September, November period, that's about 2.5% lower than a year ago. Um, for that, I'm uh, making a, a, an assumption that the pick crop is not gonna change and all the reduction is due to fewer farrowings. Uh, that implies fewer uh, uh, hogs available for next spring and it may be have an effect on how these futures uh, you know, trade for, for next year. With that said, in the last week or so, uh, the futures market has seen a significant decline and in my view, a lot of that has to do with outside markets. Uh, you have a lot of uh, large funds that were uh, long the, the market for a lot of reasons, primarily because of the shortfall in or expected shortfall in supply. And now with all these uh, outside events, uh, you know, the US dollar being very strong, interest rates going higher, uh, there's sort of been a move to take some risk off the table. And unfortunately, hog futures have uh, suffered because, you know, because of that. But as we think out front and we think about next summer, it doesn't seem to me at least that the inventory survey is telling us we're going to see a whole lot of growth. Right now, I'm paying uh, the pick crop for December, February to be up only 0.7%. And that's assuming a 1% increase year over year in the pick crop. And if we continue to have issues with PRS, then we're looking at another summer where hog supplies are going to be tight. Uh, USDA right now is uh, projecting, and if you can go to the next slide, is projecting uh, pork production to be up next year and per capita availability next year to be uh, a little bit higher than it was this year. Uh, that remains to be, you know, to be determined. One thing that I, you know, it's the takeaway in my mind from this chart, and I'll kind of uh, close with that, is that Exports are a really big part of it. And if we can go to the next one, we export about 25% of all the pork that we produce. However, if you look at since 2000, exports have accounted for about 65% of the overall growth in, the, you know, in, in, in pork production. So of, you know, if you take all the pork you know, increase that we've had during the last two decades, 65% of that increase has gone to exports. Without the export market, it's going to be very challenging to maintain prices here because, as you can see, I mean, you know, this the per capita consumption in the U.S. has tends to be fairly stable, and prices are fairly stable because of that. And so, it's going to be critical to see what happens with pork exports in the next six, nine, twelve months, and what effect this strong dollar, the strong dollar, does have on that uh, export demand, especially in those Asian markets.